Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's IAUG webinar, Web Services APIs for Beginners, presented by Andrew Prokop, Experience Builder Architect at Avaya. Before we begin, I want to take the opportunity to thank you for participating in today's webinar and for your support in IAUG. To our current members and those who are now new members, by means of joining us today, I encourage you to visit IAUG.org to get more information about how to get the most of your membership, including upcoming events, IAUG product councils, and a library of online content. Now I have three quick housekeeping items to go over. First, today's webinar will be recorded and available for you on demand. Second, a Q&A session will follow today's presentation. All questions will need to be entered in the question window near the bottom of your GoToWebinar screen. And third, there will be a short evaluation that pops up as you exit the webinar. Please take a minute and let us know what you thought of today's session and what you might like to see going forward. Okay, we can get started now. Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Julie, and uh, thanks to everyone who has uh, joined this morning. This is a pretty good number. I'm really pleased um, to see so many folks uh, and a few names that I recognize uh, uh, flashing by and a few coworkers too. So uh, to my coworkers, you're not allowed to tease me afterwards. So anyway, uh, Andrew Prokop, and again at Avaya, and I work in our Experience Builder program. This is a pretty new name for uh, an endeavor at Avaya. It really means um, taking our technology, our APIs, which I'm going to be talking about today quite a bit, and uh, you know, getting them out into the world for our uh, partners, our customers, um, third-party developers to use our technology to build uh, what we like to call experiences. So different solutions, different applications. I'm going to be talking about some of that as we go along and um, I'll take a couple of side notes to talk about some of the things that I've been building with this technology. But um, let's get started. So again, web services, APIs for beginners. Um, here's my agenda. So I will start um, with, you know, what is an API? I'm gonna start, uh, you know, in case this is new technology to you. So what it is and, and also what it isn't. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, since this is about web services, I'm gonna jump right into web services, what they are, why they're important, um, how you need to think about them a little differently than some of the things that, you know, some of the ways that you've done your business in the past. And then I'm gonna get into a couple of techie things and hopefully not too too nerdy, but uh, just so that you have a good feel for the uh, the, the words, uh, for the technology, for the uh, the nomenclature, so that when somebody talks about REST, you're not scratching your head or going to the you know internet and searching for it or JSON. I'll give you enough to let you know what that is. I'm not gonna teach you to be programmers here, but I'm going to allow you hopefully to understand um, the terminology that will be applied to web services. And then we'll talk a bit about authentication and that's obviously very important because security is um, paramount whenever we are building applications and solutions that expose our company to the outside world. And that's what cloud is all about. We're kind of opening up that channel to something other than what we've done in the past, which are these sort of monolithic closed systems. We are, we are now opening up and then I'm going to give you plenty of examples, um, some of them uh, a little techier than others, but I think all of them very understandable. And my goal is at the end of all of this, you, you, you understand when you see something that's like, it's not scary anymore. It's like, oh, I get it. I see what this is. I see what it does and I see how I can use it. And then um, because this is IAUG, I'm going to talk um, quite a bit about some of the things that are happening here at Avaya. And that's where I'll probably give some of the, um, ex, you know, um, kind of walk you through some of the stuff uh, that I'm doing with some of the technology. And then I'll end it up with uh, some of the various tools that can be used to uh, develop and play with and experiment with APIs, things that you can do today, even without a programming background, um, by simply just looking at documentation and using some of these tools and putting it all together and you can build these sort of pseudo applications without writing a single line of code. So let's move along. So let's start with the basics. So what is an API? So an API, application programming interface, it's a programmatic interface that enables data transmission between one software entity and another. So it's really, you've got two pieces of software and you want to talk between them. Typically, you have an application that you want to pull in services from somewhere else. 
uh, you don't want to write everything and nor should you want to write everything and there's something out there that can provide you technology and so you can say well I I'll go and use it so I will incorporate that API into my solution to bring in things that I normally would have to develop myself I've been a programmer for a lot of years I started in the early 1980s on um, um, Intel uh, 8088 processors and we had to write everything just absolutely everything that we wanted to do and um, and today there are so many APIs and so many libraries that the first place I start when I'm looking to build something is like well what is out there that I can use to help my make my life easier um, an API is essentially really it's a technical specification that describes the data exchange options between entities so if I give you something what are you going to give me in return what's the expected you know, uh, formatting of data that I give you and what's the expected formatting of data that you give back to me. And so again, uh, it isn't, it's, a net, it's a specification, but in the end, you need to have software behind it. So it's a software interface written to the specification that represents it. And it's important to know that APIs are not new. Um, web services APIs are newer, but APIs have been around since the dawn of programming. And again, I've been programming for a long time and I did a lot of DOS programming in the early days. And you know, I would use APIs that Microsoft you know, provided that allowed me to get down to display drivers and things like that. So there was a piece of software, there was a specification, and then there was an interface. Now we didn't have web services back in those days and we had to use uh, DLLs, dynamic link libraries. And it was a little more, a lot more convoluted than it is today, but APIs are not new. It's just now with the cloud, we're able to apply them in very different and creative ways. So uh, a couple of things I need to talk about. There's this, there's API, which I just you know loosely define, and there's this thing called an SDK and an IDE, and sometimes they get a little bit confusing as to what is to what is what. So an API is just what I told you. It's a defined interface or agreement between different entities. An SDK or a software development kit is a set of resources that facilitate the usage of APIs uh, in general. So it's code samples, it's documentation, it's language libraries. So, you know, it's an SDK for if you're a JavaScript programmer or a Go programmer or a C Sharp programmer, you'll get different libraries that make your life a whole lot easier. And then lastly, there's this thing called an IDE an integrated development environment. And that's software for building applications. So in your IDE, you'll often load up an SDK, which will then give you access to APIs. And a, a very common one is Eclipse. A lot of people use Eclipse, it's an IDE. And then uh, there's Android Studio, if you've ever developed uh, applications for Android. And so these are IDEs, again, and then they're SDKs, and then they will ultimately allow you to get access to the APIs. So Think, you can think of the API as a command, and the rest of the things are the frameworks that allow you to use those commands. Okay, and what is a web service? A web service is an API specifically written for web applications. So um, you want to talk to something on another server, although it doesn't have to be on another server, and I've written web services APIs that Inner, that inner work on the same machine, but it's a, it's, a, it's a format that says, I want to get to something that is not mine, um, and I'm gonna use web-based technology to do that, and I'll explain that as we move along. So two-way communication over HTTP or HTTPS, and you all know what this is. This is the way you get to a web page. You know, HTTP colon slash slash for a, a non-secure connection, or HTTPS for a secure connection. So you'll get some sort of encryption of the data as you move a, across the internet. It's the same thing with the web service. You're using that same technology, HTTP or HTTPS. <clears throat> it's important to know that all web services are APIs, but not all APIs are web services. So again, web services <clears throat> are uh, built specifically for web applications, but you, and again, I've been doing API work long before the web existed. Uh, at least existed in the format that, that we know today. And uh, those were not web services APIs. So web services are APIs. So it's a subset of the, 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 the you know, genus species type thing. Um, and there are four types of web services. SOAP, which has been around for a long time, and you'll still see SOAP used um, in a number of different products. I, I use it occasionally when I have to. I don't particularly like to, but it's still there. 
Um, and then there's a, a couple lesser common ones, XML RPC and JSON RPC. And the most important in my mind, and the one that will make the biggest difference in everybody's life, and the one that I'm gonna talk about here is something called REST. So you may have heard the, the expression, a REST API. Um, and so I'm gonna, the rest of this presentation is all is going to be all about REST. And, and what is a REST API? What is a, rep, what is a REST web service? So why do you want to do this? Well, it actually makes your life a whole lot easier, uh, a heck of a lot easier. Um, uh, current project that I'm working on right now um, is using uh, a Via Cloud Office technology, and a Via Cloud Office, as you know, is built on Ring Central. Well, ACO and Ring provide a set of APIs, and I'm also working with Salesforce. And so I'm doing a project that mirrors a an ACO team with a Salesforce opportunity. Um, ease of use is that I have these APIs that are exposed that allow me to get access to things in Salesforce that allow me to get access to things in ACO um, that would have been dreadfully much harder if I had to understand the underpinnings of Salesforce. And I don't, I'm not a really good Salesforce person, but the APIs make it so much easier for me to get access to data that would normally be very difficult and would probably require a lot more database programming knowledge that I have. I'm not a great database programmer, but the APIs make it a lot easier. And then this term that's batted around quite a bit, composability. So the interoperability and reuse of existing components and services. And um, that's so much of what my job is all about and what this experience builders is all about is the idea that we're taking all of these different things, think of them almost as Legos, and we're able to pull them together and build really clever solutions or compose, you know, like you're like you're uh, writing a symphony by you combining the bassoons and the, you know, the timpani and the violins and the violas and all that. And I'm pulling them all together to build my symphonic software. Agility, it's so much faster, and that goes along with ease of use. Um, Usage-based services, uh, or what I call pay by the drink. I don't have to buy and stand up this big instance of, I'll go back to Salesforce again. I don't have to, you know, Salesforce is there. I just pay by the drink or pay by the API call that um, I um, that I invoke on that platform. So it's a lot more affordable. I use all sorts of technology platforms that I pay little uh, little to use when I'm not using them, and I pay you know a fair amount when I am using them, but I don't have to put a great deal of investment in there. So usage-based services. And then this idea of a distributed architecture, and that's for any number of different reasons. Maybe it's for performance, and that we uh, you you connect to services that are nearest to you geographically, nearest to you. Uh, this really comes into play with things like real-time media. I want to connect up to something that's closer to me than something that's 8,000 miles away, and then also reliability. <clears throat> so fault tolerance um, um, in the case of uh, failures, and then we use load balancers and things to distribute the traffic around. So if your goal is cloud first, and so many companies, this is your goal today. I don't see an RFP today that doesn't talk about the cloud web services are essential. And one of the things, take a little tangent here, uh, if you are the kind of people that do RFPs, develop RFPs, high on your list should be what web services does your platform expose? Because we're not buying monolithic software anymore that has one purpose. We're buying software that can potentially have many, many purposes. So you tell me what, what software you, or what interfaces, APIs you expose because I will need to use those for my composability to build them into my solution that is unique to my needs and my enterprise. So here's a really simple picture. So on the far left is you know me as developer. I send a an API web services request. Remember it's HTTP or HTTPS. So I'm sending it across the internet. It's accepted somewhere, and I'm going to talk about what that means to be accepted and how am I addressing it. Um, and that API then goes to some backend service. Let's say it's an external um, uh, JSON-based uh, NoSQL database, and I want to insert something into that database. So I send my request across the internet. <clears throat> it's accepted by the API layer. It then goes, it does its magic in the software. And in, in this case, you know, I'm talking to their internal database. I don't know what their internal database is built with. 
All I know is that it's exposed to me in a web service, and then I get my response back. So I'm sending my requests down, I'm getting my responses back. Very simple, kind of looks like a web page, doesn't it? And again, it's built on web technology. So send your request, get your response. <clears throat> APIs are everywhere. And when I was putting this presentation together, I just thought of what are the, some of the things that I've used recently or on a very regular basis? And I could have gone on and on, but there are so many. I do work with uh, ServiceNow, all these APIs it exposes, IBM Watson. I use IBM Watson for natural language processing and language translation and things. I'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> Amazon Lex, you have your Alexa um, speakers and things, and you can use there's web services to build applications. And Meraki, um, I've done uh, things with Meraki cameras for um, uh, things like people detection and movement detection. And then I've done with IoT platforms, uh, a few of those, uh, Internet of Things, uh, MapQuest. I've you know gone out and sent <clears throat> uh, things off to figure out where things are, how to get there, all through API calls, <clears throat> RESTDB. Uh, a lot of a lot of um, Avaya technology uh, ACO there, and that's one of the things I'm working on right now. And I can go on and on and on, but there are just lots of these platforms out there, and they support web services. One of the things that I do every time I'm supposed to work with something new, I will actually go out and I will let's say I was working with um, you know go uh, I don't know uh, let's go back to MapQuest. I would go MapQuest search for MapQuest API, and then sometimes developer. And then I would be taken to the page that explains how do you talk to MapQuest? How do you get information from MapQuest um, uh, from my application? So I don't, again, I don't have to stand up a whole GPS mapping system. I know there's one out there that I can use, so I'm just going to send uh, REST calls to it. All right, so I mentioned REST quite a bit. So REST stands for Representational State Transfer. And all it is is really it's an architectural style for providing standards between computer systems on the web. So the power is that it separates the concerns of the client and the server. So you can do your work independently. So I'm building my application and I know that I need some data in my application, uh, data storage. Well, I can do my application and I can do all the places that reach out for data and I find who I want to provide my data storage platform for me, I don't care how they store the data. I don't care at all. You know, Maybe I'm concerned about performance, so I will make sure that it meets my needs, but I don't really care how it gets it's done, how it gets the job done. So I can write my application independent of how the data is stored. And it also allows me to, at some point, if I say, you know, I don't like this platform anymore, I wanna switch it out. If I've abstracted it well enough, I can just switch out to another platform. Uh, that provides REST interfaces, and voila, my application continues to run now on a separate platform. It's stateless. The server does not need to know what state the client is in, and vice versa, and, and that's very powerful if you're a programmer type to not have to worry about state. When, can, you know, when do I have to do something um, is very important. Um, and it follows something called the CRUD model, which is really just create, read, update, and delete resources. So if you think about these resources on the web uh, as, as the ability to create a new one, read an existing one, update one, or delete one. That's really all it is. So if you, if you build your applications based on resources, resources that are accessible across the, the web, then you're absolutely fitting into the REST model or the, the CRUD model. And some simple geeky stuff. Um, so some of those things I talk about for CRUD um, there's, and this is not a full list of what you can do with REST, but you can get information about a REST resource. And I'm going to give you some examples. Post, create a REST resource, put patch, update a REST resource, and delete, delete a REST resource. And you'll see that, especially if you were to get into programming and some of the tools, you'll see, well, is this a get? Is this a post? You know, is this a put, a patch, or a delete? Um, so for instance, um, on my uh, cloud-based database, uh, when I want to create a new record, I will do a post. When I get information about, when I want to retrieve information about an existing record, I do a get. When I want to delete a record, I'll do a delete. And when I want to, you know, maybe change it, uh, I could do a patch. And I'm talking to the same resource, but I'm sending it this different kind of uh, method or command to tell it I'm acting differently upon this resource, but it's the same resource each time. 
So what I mentioned HTTP, HTTPS. So a, an API web services call actually looks, not actually, it looks, it is a URL. So you look at a REST call, it looks like you're going to a web page. And in many ways, you are doing the same thing, but instead of getting back you know, HTML, which is what your browser renders to put images and things on your screen, you're getting back data. You're getting back the answer to your request. And so you have a protocol. So it's either HTTP or HTTPS. So HTTP, in this case, colon slash slash. And then I have a server path and I'm using something called open weather map, which allows me to get weather information. I can pass in things like uh, what's the weather in this location, this zip code, this country, uh, and I can do, you know, what's the prediction for tomorrow? What was the weather like six weeks ago on this day and time? I have various things I can pass to it, but I'm, I've got a server path. And then I have the resource. What's the resource of, the, of this web service that I want to access? In this case, I'm accessing the forecast resource. And then I have optional parameters in this case. Um, I have to pass in my API key that's, I, I, when I register to use Open Weather Map, it gives me a key and so we can meter my usage. So I send this URL to this server and this server then acts upon this resource with, in this case, my query parameters, and then it will return me, in this case, this is a get. You haven't seen that yet, but it'll, re it'll return back the information I've just requested. So, and let's talk just a little about the query parameters because they're pretty important. And you've seen those all the time. You're seeing them all the time when you go and grab a web, uh, a URL, let's say that um, you go uh, to uh, LinkedIn and there's a, somebody's posted an article and you go, oh, that's a really cool article. I want to copy that article. So you copy the URL from your web browser <clears throat> and you'll most likely notice a question mark at the end or somewhere in there. And after that are all these query parameters and perhaps the query parameters are telling the service, hey, this request came from LinkedIn because I want to monitor the impact of my, of my, uh, you know, my advertising, my marketing. So I know that I'm getting a lot of hits from LinkedIn and I can have the same thing with a question mark and it could somewhere in there, it could let the, uh, the server know that this came from Twitter or Facebook or something, but you use those same things in uh, web services technology. So it's a way to pass parameters to a web service right there on, on the uh, URL. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm actually, uh, this is the API call to uh, tell uh, Avaya CPASS to make a telephone call. So if I have an Avaya CPASS call and I want to make a, a telephone call from one of my uh, purchased CPASS numbers to another phone number, uh, and there's some other stuff, it's a little more gobbledygooky than I would like it to be, but um, I'm passing data. Uh, in the URL. So I'm making a web services call with the data is right there in the URL. Um, it's important to know that when you put data in a URL, you have to do something called URL encoded because sometimes there are characters that cannot go into a URL and you have to encode them. So for instance, you can't put a plus sign in a URL. So you have to do this percent two B or you can't put an exclamation point. So you put a percent two one. So this example down here at the bottom where I say percent two B um, is the uh, E164 plus um, that would be sent on a phone number. So plus one, which is again, so I'm encoding that plus. So anyway, um, you see these all the time. And, and if you never knew what this meant, now you know. And also the parameters are separated with the ampersand. So question mark begins the URL parameters and the ampersand uh, separates them. And JSON, I want to talk a little bit about JSON because this is something that you'll encounter over and over and over with web technology. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And in the olden days, and still people will sometimes use XML, XML is much more difficult to use to represent data and JSON is much, much cleaner. Uh, it's text-based. It's a text-based <clears throat> text -based way to store and transmit structured data. It has lots of advantages. It's very compact. It's easy for both computers and people to read and write. I can look at a JSON structure and you'll see a couple in just a moment and you'll know cleanly, you're know, like, oh, I know what this is. Many, many, many web services return their answers in JSON. And I can look at it as a human being and I can just find exactly what I want um, by looking at it. 
It maps very easily onto data structures used by most programming languages like numbers, strings, booleans, nulls, arrays, <clears throat> and nearly all programming languages contain functions or libraries that can read and write JSON structures. I do a lot of programming in, in Node.js, which is the service server side, server version of JavaScript. And I do a lot in JavaScript as well. <clears throat> and they're great tools for uh, reading and writing and parsing JSON. So it's sort of built right into it. And if you're a Node programmer, you know that everything is kind of just JSON based to begin with. So very common, very easy to use. <clears throat> it's really simple. It's basically name, value, name, value, name, value. And that value could be a string, a number, a Boolean, an array. It could be another object. So you'll see names and you'll see values. Here's a simple, I think simple example of a JSON structure. Starts with the squiggly bracket on top and ends with the squiggly bracket on the bottom. And inside, I have a couple of objects. One's the topic object. And that squiggly bracket, squiggly bracket to, to encapsulate the topic object. And inside it has these name values. ID is set to null, title is set to test space, description is set to built from an API call. Right underneath that, I showed an array. In this case, invitees is a, an array of objects. In this case, it only has one element in it. Um, and I have a, an invitee type, uh, invitee, and a role. Uh, what I'm doing here is actually, this is uh, used to build a spaces room and invite people into it. So this is the kind of data that I would send down to Avaya Spaces to say, hey, I want to create a new room, and I want to invite uh, AJ Prokop uh, to that room at the same time as I'm building the room, and I would invite uh, him in as a member. So anyway, that's JSON, and it's extremely common, and all the examples I give uh, throughout this presentation are built on JSON. So let's just actually look at an example. You can do this right on your computer today. <clears throat> so if you go to https colon slash slash API, dot coinbase.com and that's the server and then the resource is uh, v2 version 2 prices spot <clears throat> and then parameters question mark currency equals usd just put this into your web browser <clears throat> and it's going to come back with a bunch of json and what i've done is i've asked for and when i built this presentation this slide was probably last week <clears throat> it goes out and i'm asking for bitcoin i'm asking what is the current price of bitcoin in us dollars and it told me at that point, uh, one Bitcoin is $36,242.16. If I were to run this API call again, just copy it as is, throw it in your web browser. It's a get command. You don't know that yet, but it's a get command. The web browser will either display it, depending on how you've got your browser set up, display the JSON or download the JSON and you can look at it. Um, so again, API call to, let's say that I have an application that needs to know the current price of Bitcoin. Well, I don't have a database that knows the current price of Bitcoin, but I know that there's a web service out there that could get me the information in real time. So that is the most simplest simplest kind of example. <clears throat> so content. Um, when you make a web service call, you can tell it what you're willing, what you're giving it and what it's returning to you. And so content might be none. You're not giving it anything. In that Bitcoin example, I wasn't really giving it anything. I had some parameters on the command line, but they were just parameters. But I can actually, and I'll show you a bit, I can actually send it data. So I can say none, or I can send it in JSON or XML or plain. And I'm a big, big believer in JSON. Uh, if you're using SOAP, you'd be using XML, much harder to work with, harder to use. So I do, if I want to use an API, I'm, I'm really, really happy when it supports JSON. And most do these days. <clears throat> and also what you're willing to get back. And you can actually get back a particular type, like I can get back JSON or XML, or I can actually say I can get more than one type. I can say, I wanna get JSON and XML for whatever reason that you might wanna do that. So when you make a web services call, you tell it what you're sending it, and it tells you, and you tell it, give it back to me in this format. <clears throat> and authentication, um, you can have no authentication, like that Bitcoin example. It lets anybody in the world get access to that API without any signing up, no passwords, no user accounts. Um, basic, that's uh, another common one, user ID and passwords. Uh, there's custom, where you they actually give you what's called an API key or something. There are a lot of different ways to do custom because that's what it is, it's custom. It's that particular service has a particular way of authenticating and probably the most powerful and the most complicated to use is something called OAuth2 and I'll spend just a moment on OAuth2 and you've seen it, you may not know it, but you've seen it. 
OAuth2 is when you go out and it says, hey, I want to use um, your Gmail or something like that, your Gmail account, and then you get something that comes back and says, oh, this application would like to view your email address, view your basic profile, manage your contacts, and you say yes or no. <clears throat> what you're doing is you're saying, I'm using my, I'm allowing this application to get access to information in a very controlled way. <clears throat> but they don't ever really get access directly to it. They get access to, to sort of this intermediary thing. And that's what OAuth 2 allows you to do. And so again, when it says, hey, I'd like to sign in with my you know, LinkedIn account or something, and then it goes off and says, okay, this application wants to use your account to do this. Do you give it permission? That's OAuth 2. And then it looks like this. So if you're your client application, this could be you on the web, and then you've got your backend services and you send your authorization request. And what it'll do is this, this is where you're saying, I want to use my Gmail account. It will pop up that little message and it says, do you allow it? And if you allow it, then it says, okay, this user has granted access to it. Now the application can go back and say, hey, I got a grant. Okay, uh, I want to get some information. And it looks at the grant, it looks at things. Says, yeah, that's, that's a legal grant, I like that. I will give you a token now to now go off and get that data that you asked for and then you get the finally the protected resource. So this OAuth 2 flow looks like this. You the, the authorization grant, <clears throat> and then the grant becomes a token, and then the token becomes is used to re, uh, retrieve the resource. <clears throat> okay, another thing that you probably hear a lot, webhook. A webhook is uh, a way for an application to provide other applications with real-time information. Um, it's sometimes called a reverse API, and it's really pretty simple. So, uh, a webhook is I'm building an application and I need to know asynchronously that something has happened. So I say, I'm going to give you, Mr. and Mrs. Web Service, service provider, I'm going to give you an interface back to me so that when something of importance happens, you can tell me in real time. I don't have to poll for it. <clears throat> um, and so it's really a REST entry point into the client application. Uh, and both post and get are common. So the creating resources and retrieving information about resources. Here are a couple examples. I have an IoT platform, Internet of Things, that launches a workflow after a telemetry threshold has been exceeded. So let's say I have a sensor and it needs, and it's monitoring temperature because I'm monitoring blood supply. And I need to know when the blood exceeds the temperature of minus two degrees Celsius, because I need to take action. Maybe I need to create a team to say, hey, we have a problem, go fix it, whatever. So I create a webhook that says, register with this platform, it says, hey, when this event occurs, send me an event, send me this webhook, invoke my webhook and tell me it's occurred so I can now take action, fire off some other workflow. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I do all the time with CPAS, if I have CPAS programming is, hey, tell me when uh, there's an incoming call or text message because I want to invoke a workflow to start processing this call or text message. So I provide a webhook back to the server to then tell me when something has occurred. Or in my database example, so I have a cloud database and I can put things in it, I can update things and I can delete them programmatically. Well, it also provides a web interface. Well, what if a user, a human being sits down and deletes a record? My application wants to know that. So I provide a webhook that now that cloud service invokes me and says, hey, you know that database that you've got out there? Somebody just deleted a record. <clears throat> and this is the record that was deleted. Now I can take action. I can update whatever I was doing on my end because that record doesn't exist anymore. Maybe I was, maybe that record represented something that I was monitoring. Well, if it's been deleted, I can stop monitoring that record. And again, when I, <clears throat> I mentioned early on, I'm doing stuff with a via cloud office and Salesforce. If somebody goes and deletes the opportunity, I want to know that because I don't need to start, I don't need to monitor it anymore because it's gone. <clears throat> so, so let's get a little bit fancier. Let's sort of pull all these pieces together. So here is a, a real live invocation. I'm using IBM Watson translation. And so it's a post. And with a post, I'm creating a record, in this case, a translation record. Um, the host or my server is gateway.watsonplatform.net. I'm invoking this resource, the language translator API v3 translate with a version, a particular version I'm uh, invoking of that. I'm passing it JSON. How do I know that? Because it says content type. I'm passing it JSON and I'm telling it I want to get JSON because there's an accept. 
I'm using basic authentication. <clears throat> so I would, that's where I would have my user ID and my password. I would encrypt it, put it in there and say it's a basic thing. <clears throat> and I'm passing it JSON. So I'm saying, hey, I'm passing you the words, hello, I'm passing the phrase hello world. <clears throat> and I say, I want you to do the model of English to Spanish. And so I would invoke this URL at the bottom. <clears throat> Underneath the covers, it's doing the post and all that. And I'm passing this data. <clears throat> and then IBM Watson will come back and say, well, here, <clears throat> here are a variety of translations from English to Spanish. And the first one is almost always the best one. So hola mundo, that's hello world. <clears throat> and then the other one, como se estas? So it says that's a, an optional translation, but uh, you know that's up to IBM to tell me that. So I say, translate this phrase, comes back in JSON, gives me an array, notice the brackets, it's an array of potential translations. <clears throat> and then my application goes on and does whatever it's gonna do. You know, maybe I'm in a text chat bot and somebody starts typing Spanish, <clears throat> but all uh, are, you know, English and my all my stuff is built in Spanish. So I, you know, I go and translate it on the fly. I don't build the translator. I don't know how to translate. I don't, you know, my, my, I barely speak English. So let's use a service out there that does it. <clears throat> Here's another good one. So the last one was a post. This is a get. So I'm asking information. In this case, I'm making actually a call to Avaya Spaces. Spaces, <clears throat> APIs at aviacloud.com. I'm accepting JSON. I'm not passing in anything. In this case, I'm <clears throat> asking information about a particular room, you know, a, a room type. <clears throat> and it would give me all this information about the room. Do, 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 do. That's a lot of gobbledygook there, but it's actually it's fairly easy for once you understand, you know, how to read JSON. It's pretty easy to understand what's coming back. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little bit about APIs at Avaya. So, if you're a, an Aura person, and I'm an old-time Aura person, been there around there a long time. Well, System Manager provides a whole bunch of RESTful APIs that allow me to get access to System Manager data just the same way as the System Manager web page does. So I circled a couple of things. So System Manager provides a set of RESTful web services. Now we know what REST is, puts and gets and patches and posts and deletes, <clears throat> but it doesn't do JSON. I've circled down there, it does XML. So I know that I'm doing REST with XML. Okay, and then once once I know that, then I would go into the documentation. I'd look at what can System Manager do for me? What are the web services APIs it exposes? <clears throat> All right. Avaya Conversational Intelligence. It's a really cool product. It allows you to listen to telephone calls in real time and then pull out the intent, what's happening, uh, pull out the, the sentiment or the tone. I can detect anger <clears throat> or empathy or whatever. Or, you know, when certain keywords are said, I can take action. There's a whole RESTful API <clears throat> for Avaya Conversational Intelligence. And it also provides webhooks so that I can again, register for when certain events occur as it's parsing this text. So there's an, an application, the Envir Conversational Intelligence application is cloud-based, but I might want to integrate it with some of my backend services. So what I would do is I would look at the RESTful interface and I'd build my applications to talk to it. And of course, there's OneCloud CPaaS APIs and I do all sorts of stuff with OneCloud CPaaS APIs and you should too. It's an over-the-top cloud solution for a telephony platform. It provides telephony, <clears throat> SMS, and MMS, which is the multimedia, so pictures, text, allows me to, it has APIs for usage and conferencing and building SIP trunks <clears throat> and recording and transcription and carrier services. Like you have a phone number. I wanna know, is this a cell phone or not? Is it a mobile device? <clears throat> well, I can go out and call it. I wanna get information about the subscriber. I can call the carrier services APIs and on and on and on. And then there's one called inbound XML, which is that webhook thing that says, hey, when an incoming call comes in, I want you to tell me about it. And then I'm going to send you back instructions as we move along that tell you how to control this call. You know, <clears throat> I want you to answer the call. I want you to say, you know, uh, read this announcement. I want you to collect this information. I can build an entire IVR system with inbound XML and then uh, potentially arrest calls. And you can find all that documentation <clears throat> at the link down there or just search for Avaya, CPaaS, REST APIs. That's how I do everything. I don't have any URLs memorized other than maybe gmail.com. <clears throat> um, I just pulled one of them out here, list SMS. Uh, so I wanna go and, and go to my account. I have a phone number I purchased from CPaaS and I wanna know all the SMS messages that were sent to receive them that phone number. Well, there's an API call that can do it. <clears throat> and it's a REST call. I go to the documentation, shows me what to do, how to set it up, 
and then you know what my parameters are and I go bingo go <clears throat> and um, it will give me the answer and I actually <laughs> The, the answer is in a, a moment because one of the things I forgot is I want to do authentication and it does um, a basic authentication and I get my user ID, which is my account SID and my password, which is my auth token from the CPASS dashboard. I would build that into my REST call <clears throat> and it would look something like this underneath the covers. <clears throat> now you'll never code this, but this is what it looks like. Um, uh, if you're going to use any sort of language or something, it's going to do a whole lot of this for you. And I'll show you that in a moment. <clears throat> but I'll make this call, basic authentication, my user ID and my password, uh, blah, blah, blah. And it comes back and it gives me this big, long array. I know it's an array because right there in the middle, you see SMS underscore messages in the bracket of all of the text messages that were sent and received on this <clears throat> uh, for phone number that I queried. And it will tell me whether it's inbound or outbound. It will tell me the message itself. <clears throat> tell me all sorts of stuff. Told me how much it cost. So again, this simple API call can retrieve back all this information. And there are lots and lots and lots of API calls to build really cool, powerful, over-the-top applications. <clears throat> and then Avaya Spaces. I do a world of stuff with Avaya Spaces. I uh, create users and I create rooms or spaces. I can do file upload and download and send chat messages. And there's a whole asynchronous WebSocket interface to tell me when certain events have occurred and things like that. Again, there's the documentation. If you don't want to know the URL, which I don't know the URL, you just go search for Avaya Spaces REST API and it will take you right to this. <clears throat> um, and it'll show you all sorts of APIs, REST APIs, how to use them, what the parameters are. You can see at the top here, there's a post command. This particular command actually creates a new spaces room and invites people to it. <clears throat> and if I send it off, it gives me an, you know, I, I, I post the information and it gives me an answer back. So I know I'm going kind of fast on this, <clears throat> but the whole point is I send it JSON and it gives me JSON back and it tells me, hey, I just built a room for you. This is the ID of the rooms ID. So when you want to use that room, rem remember that ID. It's called topic ID here and it will use it <clears throat> throughout my, my programming. I don't ever code by writing the HTTPS out by hand. I use languages. So this is an example of you, me doing it in Node.js. If you're not a Node.js programmer, it's not important. The whole idea is it makes it really simple. I say, hey, it's a post. Here's the URL. Here's the headers. <clears throat> Here's the body. Do it for me. And I also do a lot in um, JavaScript. So then I would use like JS query or something like that. <clears throat> and so I would do that here. Mm -hmm. So this little feller here, this is my dog, <clears throat> Watson, and I build a, an application using the Spaces APIs that adds over-the-top video to a contact center call. So let's say that you're talking to somebody, you're an agent, you're talking to a, a caller, and you need to see something. You need to see Watson, or you know, you're, a, you're having, you know, my dog looks sick, whatever, or my car is broken, I need to show you something. <clears throat> they could text you a link. That link allows the customer on their mobile phone just to click that link. It brings up a one-way video connection back to the contact center agent so you can see what the customer is trying to show you while you continue to talk on the phone. So I've used the APIs to build this over-the-top application, which is contact center independent. <clears throat> you know, I just text them a link. I now get video back to the contact center agent. So pretty cool. It's not a product. It was a proof of concept that I built, which hopefully will be a product. Build it with the APIs. <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the tools and we're going to wind this thing down. So um, tools to test and build APIs or play with them. Uh, Curl is the most common. Uh, Postman, I use that all the time. And there's Swagger and Swagger-like tools, uh, which allow you to do basically test API calls right from a web page, right from the documentation. Swagger is a really common one. Avaya uses, oh, and I have a typo, CPASS. It should be, the A is next to the S. <clears throat> CPASS API Explorer. Uh, and there are others. Uh, I really, it's either Curl, Postman, or a Swagger or Swagger-like for me. <clears throat> and so Curl, real common library. You can download it to your uh, Mac, PC, and then send Curl commands. <clears throat> uh, if you go to, like, this is a case of Avaya CPASS, and you look at um, the documentation, it actually shows you the Curl right there what you would do to test this out. <clears throat> and I look at this when I'm building my applications because it allows me to see what the parameters, I know how to speak curl, shows me how I should format things. <clears throat> and then Swagger, it's basically do it right from a web page. 
um, which is really cool. You go to the documentation, it allows you to fill in some data and you press go, or in this case, try it out and it gives you your answer. And a super, super common one is Postman. Uh, Postman is both an application and a web service, a web application. I use Postman all the time. <clears throat> I have a whole collection of APIs, uh, you know, invocations that I put in Postman so I can test them out. I can see if I give it this information, this is what it will give me. If I change it a little bit, this is what it will give me before I ever write any application so I could test things. Well, I want to test, well, what happens, you know, I want to, I want to check to see if a phone number is a, you know, a cell number. Well, I could go to the uh, CPAS APIs, figure out what they are, put them in Postman, write the call. I go, oh, I get this data back. This is the JSON. I really want this field, the mobile, you know, true or false field. That's what I want. So that's what my application will trigger on. So again, really common. Uh, it allows you to, again, not write a line of code uh, and work with APIs. And again, if I go back to swaggers and the swagger likes, I don't, I'm not writing any code. code. I'm just sitting on a web page testing things out. So, a little summary, uh, APIs <clears throat> are the cornerstone of modern day software development. I, not only do I consume APIs constantly on all of my work, I provide APIs. So when I build my applications, um, I'm, if I realize that I'm providing a service worthwhile, <clears throat> well, why don't I expose that as an API as well? So both giving and receiving. And as I mentioned earlier, the idea of the webhook. Um, if I want to be asynchronously notified that something has occurred, I can build my application, <clears throat> register a webhook so that it gets invoked when something has happened. Again, go back to CPAS, when an incoming call <clears throat> has arrived on a phone number that I've purchased, I want to know that because I want to take action. Or if I think about spaces, <clears throat> you know, I, if I go and um, set up a spaces room, well, I want to know when somebody sent a chat message to it because maybe I'm building a bot that can intercept that chat message and then respond back to the spaces room <clears throat> with that, with the response. So I want to know that. So I'm doing web services to, you know, <clears throat> build rooms and web services to know when something has occurred. Cloud services are built on RESTful web services. It's the cornerstone. <clears throat> it is the cornerstone of cloud development. So if you as an organization are going cloud, look to see what web services are delivered. Again, I start with, if I was doing an RFP and I'm going for a platform, I would say, well, hey, what web services are you delivering? Because I am most likely going to want to um, be uh, have the ability to integrate your services in with things that I need to do in my own custom, proprietary custom way. <clears throat> so it will add value to and to my customer experience, both internal and external, by integrating your workflows with my workflows. So again, uh, cloud services are built on RESTful web services, Cornerstone <clears throat> and Avaya, and especially Avaya One Cloud because it is a cloud platform, expose a plethora, I like that word, a plethora of powerful APIs. And again, they can be found in any number of different ways. <clears throat> um, very important. So, um, and I think if I hit uh, my arrow, we come to my favorite slide. Yes, we do. Thank you. <clears throat> so that's it. Uh, Julie, uh, let me look at the uh, question and answers here. <clears throat> uh, here's one. <clears throat> um, and maybe this was asked a little early. How does Avaya deliver APIs? <clears throat> well, I, there are two ways. And when I when I think deliver APIs, I mean I think that what that means is how are they made available? Um, and there are two ways, and one is that we have uh, websites dedicated to those different services, and so you'd go to the services, you know, search for that particular service again, CPaaS Spaces. They we have our own web pages, um, or in in many cases, um, in some products. Um, the, the place to start would be DevConnect, <clears throat> so uh, via DevConnect. So you'd go to DevConnect, and then you would find all the different APIs that Avaya uh, supports. In fact, that slide where I showed System Manager is really just a screen uh, capture from DevConnect for um, System Manager <clears throat> um, web services. So again, Avaya delivers them either through DevConnect or we have our own um, 
uh, pages for it and own services. Um, and I also want to point out too that not only do these pages uh, provide you with uh, the interfaces, but they also provide you with the SDKs. Remember what is that slide number three or two or three? What is an SDK, SDK, a software development kit? Again, I want to know the interface and sometimes I want to code raw to the interface. So I'm going to use, you know, Node or uh, Java or, you know, JavaScript. I'm just going to code to the REST interface. But in many cases, <clears throat> I just want to, I want to get access to like a Node.js SDK, which allows me to talk to the API without actually having to code <clears throat> the HTTP call. You know, it's a, I do that a lot with all of my work at um, Avaya Cloud Office. Uh, I do, I've never written directly to the API. I, I write to the SDK, the JavaScript or the Node JS SDK that it gives me. So it allows me to uh, create an instance, connect up, and then send commands across the interface. Underneath the covers, it's doing the REST calls for me, but the SDK hides all of that from me. Um, and also allows me to manage uh, my authentication in a much easier way so I can build my OAuth uh, flows and use them. And I haven't, I don't want to get too deep into OAuth. There's a, <clears throat> there's a client ID and a secret token and a client secret and all there's a redirect URI. It hides all that from me by using the SDK to do that. So I hope that answered the question. Um, and there's another one about CPaaS and how do, <clears throat> how do I get CPaaS? Well, uh, it's really easy. Um, uh, CPASS, anyone can register for an account, <clears throat> free to register for an account. Uh, and then uh, as a, that earlier slide where I said pay by the drink and each of the API calls has a small, tiny cost like 0 0.005 cents for some things and sometimes a lot less. Um, <clears throat> and so you need money in your account. Avaya, thankfully, when you create your account, will give you some free money and allow you to start playing with um, CPASS phone numbers. So. Uh, I have an entire, uh, if you go to uh, YouTube and you search for the Avaya channel, I have an entire webinar that shows you how to become a CPaaS developer. Uh, so just please do that. Uh, YouTube, uh, search for the Avaya account, and then there's a whole Avaya, C, Avaya One Cloud CPaaS how to videos. It's a playlist on YouTube for the Avaya account. Lots, I have lots and lots of uh, uh, videos out there. So again, you get your account, <clears throat> you get some, some free money, you start playing with the APIs. Uh, you can download the SDKs if you want to do it for particular languages. And that looks like about it. So uh, I really appreciate everyone being here. And I have to say, it's been a fantastic turnout. I'm really pleased at how many people are interested in this. Do you have any uh, questions beyond this? Uh, I am not hard to find. I'm all over LinkedIn. Uh, I, I should point out one thing. I keep a, a, a GitHub of lots of code that I write, and I make it available for free. <clears throat> Anybody who wants to see how to do things. So reach out to me on LinkedIn. I've often published that uh, GitHub many times. That's it. So Julie, thank you. It's, it's now yours. All right, great. Well, I want to say thank you to you, Andrew, for taking the time to speak to us today. As a reminder to the audience, this webinar was recorded and will be available for you on demand. You'll receive an email with a link to that recording in the next 24 hours. To continue discussions like this and access more technical conversations and resources, we encourage you to visit our website at IAUG.org. Please also make sure to complete the short evaluation that will pop up as you exit the webinar. And from all of us at IAUG, thank you and have a great rest of your day.